Chapter 49, My City. He wore a fedora on his head, and he had a style about him you could now only see in black and white movies. He wore a common black tie, common gray suit, along with some common gray trousers to match. And when he wore them, he did so not because he was some businessman, some Gordon Gecko, trying real hard to look professional or important to anyone. No. He did so as a uniform of his generation, of his principles and his prestige. This man here was a real deal G.I. Joe. This man was no spoiled and pathetic baby boomer that prayed to rock and roll to keep his skin looking young and his life free of any responsibilities. He had scars. His face looked old and seasoned and wrinkled and he stood there proud to wear them. He was a splitting image of classic Americana. A man that had lost his innocence a very, very, very long time ago while in WW2. Hearing the sound of screaming Japanese soldiers being burned alive in a hole, lit up by a blowtorch somewhere in Iwo Jima, or while growing up starving to death fighting over a dead rat with another eight-year-old child like himself, like seeding wild animals during the Great Depression. He was the perfect ideal of what a real man once used to be, and he was a classic evil most people today had been very fortunate never to have truly experienced. That is, until now. Boss man, something must have happened, commented Angel Eyes, who was standing at the doorway with a toothpick in his mouth, smiling through his teeth. The fedora man edged his head forward and whispered something into Angel's ear. Miss Jackson, Mr. Dorian wants to know what the fuck is going on, spoke Angel in for Mr. Dorian. Nikki stood in petrified silence. She seemed to be trying her best to collect up the pieces of her fallen facade she had earlier, but seemed unable to do so. It was now totally lost to her as she continued to stand there half shivering while half trying her hardest not to shiver. Oh, Nikki, don't fall apart now. I don't know what to, I don't know what to do here. These are people you're used to dealing with. But Michael remembered Nikki as a meticulous planner that liked everything in its place and everything done in orderly fashion. And since the havoc Michael had caused coming here, Nikki was now out of her element. Now dealing with these guys, since everything was at disarray. So, boss man, the Chocha is here, but what should we do with him? Asked Angel Lights as he smiled at Michael as if he already knew what his boss man's answer would be. I got a bad feeling, bad, just bad, looking at these two. The fedora man then took one last glance at Michael and Nikki, looked at the window that was shattered behind them, and said, Matalo. Ah, shit, thought Michael. And at that moment, Michael saw Anthony's revolver on the desk and went for it. He quickly grabbed it, and as he looked up, while holding the piece up to be aimed, Ah, shit, again, thought Michael, now finding himself at a standoff. For Angel Eyes had also gotten a hold of that forty-four Magnum of his he had earlier. Angel now stood there pointing it at Michael as Michael there stood pointing his back. Wait, please. I'm sorry, Mr. Dorian. I know how crazy this all this must... Mr. Dorian wants to know where Mr. Cookie is. Who is this Karachimba? And why is the window behind you too broken? Spoke out Angel in an even tone, cutting Nikki in mid-sentence. Also did so even though Mr. Dorian hadn't even said to Angel anything. The two just seemed to be linked like that. And it was then that Michael felt his old drive. Rompus pompous. Felt it. And how it was now the moment to get involved. Say something quick. Anything really. Before things got too ugly. Mr. Cookie is dead and the window behind me is broken. Because I pushed him out of it. Replied Michael. And as for who I am. That's none of your fucking business. Ah, hell. I've seen too many Dirty Harry movies and ah, fuck it. Just go with it. Maybe it'll work. Before this night, Michael had never once held a gun at someone. He had held a gun before, but never like this. This now was a new experience for him, and he was now feeling a uniquely new sense of power and precedence that he had never before experienced. Oh, this isn't me, thought Michael, for he now felt how it wasn't suiting him. One bit, it felt too powerful and maniacal and mechanical, like something he felt had no heart and humanity to be found in, unlike the pros and valiance and violence that it took in just beating another man with one's own fists. This felt inhuman, but still Michael was stuck with it, 
for he needed this leverage because he knew his fists alone were going to be no match against the 44 Magnum Angel Eyes was holding on to there. The Fedora Man then grinned, seeing Michael, for he seemed like he must have enjoyed hearing his baldness. And as he grinned, it looked like his old face almost cracked up doing so. Oh, boss man, I think I know this guy. He's that hijo de puta at Stumpy's place everyone was talking about before I got there. And the man I saw at the trope that took out Felipe. The old man leaned forward and whispered something else to him. Okay, Carachimba. Mr. Doria wants to know what you want. Another iron monkey had now entered the scene and Michael saw that he was carrying a Kalajna called 47. Well, for one thing, I want to know why the old dude can't speak for himself. That's Michael growing curious as to what type of character he was dealing with, with Mr. Dorian there. Something about those eyes. Something about those eyes of his. Something hellish about them. And also something familiar. I want to see them again, like I did back when I was still with Sad Boy. Both Mr. Dorian and Angel Eyes were looking at each other, grinning in amusement. Who the fuck is this guy? They were probably thinking to themselves. Mr. Dorian has come here to do business with the lady and Mr. Cookie. Not with you, Karajimba. But now he wants to know why my friend over there shouldn't gun you both down, asked Angel Eyes. Motherfucker. That's because I'm still holding a gun, pointing it straight at his big ugly mug. And I won't hesitate to put a hole in it before your friend there blows us two away. So does that sound like a reason enough not to? Shit, I've never shot a, I've never shot a man before. Well, I better be up to doing it now for to survive this. Okay, Karachimba. Oh, and if you call me a Karachimba again, I'll just shoot him on principle and then shoot your balls off and make you into a Kakoro. So feel free to try me again and we'll see what happens, said Michael. Oh, that was nice. Sass Boy was also a Colombian, so for Michael, there wasn't a Spanish curse word in the Colombian slang he didn't know. Plus, Michael himself understood Spanish fluently. Angel Eyes didn't respond, and he now had a psychotic look in his eyes like he wanted to gut Michael with a Bowie knife. For he obviously didn't like hearing some gringo white boy putting him in his place, and especially in his own slang. Me and the lady are leaving, said Michael. No, you're not. No, you're not. Not just yet. Your bitch there has my cargo. In a heavily locked facility, I need the access codes to get to them. The old man finally spoke directly. There was a menace in his voice that would have made any other man piss their pants just hearing him speak. Nikki, what is he talking about? Heavily locked facility? You told me the truck was in the garage, asked Michael. Our building used to have government offices, and it has a second lower level garage that can't be accessed without codes. It's why he chose this building and chose to come to us, explained Nikki. Okay, fine, give it to them. Give them what they want and let's leave, said Michael. Nikki didn't respond. Nikki, did you hear me? Give them what they want let's get the fuck out of here. No, cried out Nikki. For a second there, Michael tried to direct his head at her to look at her, but quickly redirected his attention back at the jack-off still holding a Kalashnikov. He had a split-second mistake that could have gotten us both killed. What do you mean no? demanded Michael. Miss Jackson, little girl, I'll tell you something. If you don't give me my access codes, I'm going to make sure you at least get out of this alive. Just so my boys here can show you what they do to women in their country that don't know how to show their men some manners. Explained Mr. Dorian, who, who didn't seem that much beyond what was to be expected from him. And Angel Eyes now went ear to ear with the edges of his lips, hearing his boss man promising that. And then started looking Nikki up and down in a perversely excited manner, playing around with the idea while playing around with the toothpick in his mouth, as if demonstrating with it what he'd do to her if given the chance. The hombre with the AK also smiled, showing off his pearly plaque encrusted teeth. Shit, what do we do now? Now, it wasn't that Michael didn't care if Mr. Dorian had his way blowing up the 1999 building and killing a whole bunch of people. It wasn't that since he didn't even know anything about it all some 20 or so minutes ago. What it was was it all still hadn't sunk in yet for Michael since he was still feeling way out of his league dealing with all this. Nikki, we don't belong here, argued Michael. No. You don't belong here. I let Rad Boy drag me into this craziness. I did nothing about it. Then it's his fault. Not yes, yes, it's my fault, Michael. 
I could have left before. I could have told somebody, but instead, I allowed myself to play along. I feel sober now, and... And she now looked at the fedora man in the way. And I'm not giving you your fucking code. You got that? Lashed out Nikki. Angel Eyes had now taken his shades off, as if to commemorate the moment. As if he knew what this all meant. Not giving his boss man what he wanted. Knew and knew what was about to happen. For next to him, the fedora man, his head, began to then grow in size, bigger and bigger. There seemed to be a lot of hell brewing there, inside. But on the outside, the old timer looked like he hadn't had this much fun in centuries. Ah, shit, thought Michael. She's right, if the bomb goes off, she's going to be responsible for a whole bunch of deaths. And I don't want that on her. I don't. Thought Michael, also, as he began to gain reason why you should care more. Fine, Nikki. You don't have to give them shit. We're leaving. No, you're not. Just give me the fucking codes. Bellowed out Mr. Dorian. Hey, watch it. Watch it, old man. Someone as ancient as you shouldn't get too excited. You might... Have a heart attack and croak on the spot, spat out Michael, since he was now mostly going off autopilot with the sass talk. Which, come to think of it, might be fun to watch, explained Michael as he now felt like he was starting to overdo it. Ah, shut the fuck up. Don't provoke him. What good would that do? Even though this wasn't Michael's scene, I'm here now, here at this place. He was now feeling like he should make it his. He had come all this way for something, definitely something. He felt would be important, a sense of resolve, a sense of regaining all he felt he had lost. Killing Radboy hadn't given him that sense of resolve. And worse shit, it was now and only now Michael was finally allowing himself to accept certain facts, which he had refrained himself from doing so before. Most importantly, the one fact that Radboy had, that had Radboy not being responsible of the fire at Mary's building all those years ago. Ah, hell. It was all true, the stupid fucking report. Why didn't I allow myself to accept it then? Back in prison, during the first few years he was in, Michael had made an inquiry into the fire department over the cause of the fire that night. And the information that Michael received into the investigation, I feel sick to my stomach now, was that the cause of the fire had nothing to do with arson but had all to do with some old lady on the second floor suffering a stroke and dying, leaving a burning stove unattended. Bullshit, fucking. This didn't sit well with Michael, for he didn't want to believe that to be the cause of the fire. Something so incidental and commonplace didn't want to believe so much so that he went so far as to make himself then believe the woman's coronary report must have been false. That her death hadn't been natural, making himself believe that she was really murdered, leaving her stove blatantly left unattended by those two numbskulls, still being behind it all, therefore so being Radboy, behind a whole elaborate scheme. (laughs) Wow. Man, I was kidding myself to make myself believe in all that. Something had driven him this far, and Michael deep down understood how there was never any rational reason to it. For he didn't really come all this way for Radboy or for revenge or for his sister. How is this possible, coming all this way? How would I have been able to accomplish it, not being righteous? How? He did it for his own selfish reasons. And now, for what he saw, he was facing a madman that now had his own. Seriously, I've I've always stood by being righteous. How did I... How did it... Ah, fuck me. I really am a piece of shit. Why did I... Why did I convince myself of all that? Well, there's no more turning back. I gotta do something now. If I'm to stop this asshole with his own selfish reasons, blowing up this building and killing all those people, and me, and Nikki, in the process. Even though Michael really wasn't responsible for all this mess, unlike the mess left below, just outside the window behind him, even though none of his, he was now willing to make it his, and mostly for Nikki. And maybe also a bit for myself still to see if I, to see if I can redeem something, since I really feel like a shit, feel like shit right now. No matter how hard Michael wanted to deny it, this mess with the bomb that was going to murder hundreds of hundreds of people was still all her fault. She was responsible of it happening. The whole city was already going up in flames, and now a bomb was going to go off in the heart of Manhattan. Having seen what Nikki had become, Michael now felt that maybe 
If he could do something to fix all this, it might be enough to save her of her own wrongdoing, along with saving him of his. Also, he really, really, really didn't want her to be responsible for all this. <sighs> Who is this lady and what happened to the what happened to the Nikki I knew? If anything, maybe I sort of feel like we're somehow both meant for each other. And still, after all these years, we've now both obviously become very selfish, narcissistic, and all around very bad people in our lives. But I like to believe we're, we've at least now reached our limits. That there, Michael felt there was some truth to it. They had definitely gone over their heads, Michael in his own way and Nikki in hers. But now the chips were in the hands of a monster that wanted to take things beyond their limits and into his own extremes. The chips were in the hands of such, or or maybe at least not yet. Nikki still seemed to be holding on to some cards that seemed to be in her favor. And it was now time to see what difference they could make. Say, are you trying to test me, son? Please tell me that you are. I don't want to be disappointed. Talk to me some more. I want to hear what else you have to say. And then all of a sudden, Michael and Nikki began to really see into the character of the fedora man that stood before them, and it all felt like there was some sleeping giant slowly being awakened. Even the two Colombians were seemingly afraid of what was about to happen, as they backed off a bit from Mr. Dorian to give the man air. Mr. Dorian's head still seemed to be growing more and more, still growing by the second, by the size, as he began to live up to that whole big white head name everyone had been given him. Why was he a psychotic looking fuck too? Now that I'm starting to see his true colors. You know, I'm curious. Nikki told me you were some old CIA operative and all. But I'm curious to know who and what you really are. Asked Michael, for he just couldn't help but to wonder. Even through the dread. The fedora man said nothing. But Michael continued to watch him. This demonic titan crawling its way out of Tartarus. No, I'm serious. What the fuck are you? What type of psychotic maniac are you? You don't even look human anymore. What type of fucked up madness gave birth to an antichrist looking motherfucker like you? And then it began. This city, here. Do you see this city, son? Look outside, do you see it? Michael needed a moment then as this Mr. Dorian also seemed to need a moment for obviously shit was about to get belligerent. At least a little. Well, I'll tell you. That there, that city out there, that out there's my city, mine, my home, for I was born there, said Mr. Dorian, panting as he did, not as a wild cat nor an excited hippo, but something truly apex and also deranged. Yeah, I know, hell of a town, ain't it, responded Michael, unsure if he should. And in my city out there, do you know what I see when I look? What I see flourishing and festering out there? Do you, son? Do you? No? Well, I'll tell you. I see nothing but cowards. Whimpering, moaning, pitiful cowards. A bunch of mooks afraid of their own shadows. Afraid of their own true selves and their own true nature. Because I'll tell you why. If they only knew what they were capable of. If they were only pushed far enough to know. They would see how there would be no end to what they would be capable of. Michael had no response to that. The bigger the old man's head got explaining all this, the smaller Michael began to feel, and now beginning to even feel his words creep into his own head. Ah, shit, his eyes. The fucker's really staring at me now. Fuck. Why did I ask for them? It's not just that stupid shit I imagined back with Gabe. It's real and in front of me this time. Can I ask you something, son? Have you ever murdered another man? With just your bare hands? Asked Mr. Dorian. I ain't Michael like a starving animal. No, gasped Michael. And I don't mean quick and painlessly. I mean, have you ever squeezed? And Mr. Dorian now demonstrated with his hands, pretending to squeeze his head so hard that the man slowly began to feel his brain crush within his own skull. Demanded Mr. Dorian as he lifted his hands up in display at what he had just imaginably done. Now, it wasn't just what Mr. Dorian was saying that was beginning to appall Michael in a profound way. It was the way in which he was saying it. 
like a man that had actually been there to do those dastardly deeds, explaining how it felt, not just through words, but through experience in the feel of it. And it was that that had Michael now understanding perfectly, as if he was now experiencing it for himself. Oh, making him feel sick to his stomach and squeamish. I can feel the victim screaming. So in loved and enamored did the fedora man seem to be about all this, that it started making Michael feel like dry heaving. When you did all this with your own bare hands, did you feel ecstasy? What? Ecstasy? The fuck is seriously psychotic? I told you no, old man. I'm not a... Have you, son? Have you? I said no. Shots beautiful joy, such glorious victory, vanquishing another, that it makes you feel like a god amongst men. Have you felt such greatness? Have you, son? Have you? No, I haven't. I've never had this shit feel like heaven when I'm sitting on their chest, pummeling their... Ah, shit. As there is a dark side to every man, as hard as Michael tried to deny his, he couldn't deny that feeling. For it was a feeling he knew all too well, even though never a murderer before this night, he still knew the feeling a man got exerting excruciating pain onto another, and knew all too well about the ecstasy. No, fuck, no. That came with it. No, only bad people feel that way. Evil people. And I'm not a, a feeling better than sex. No, no. You fucking piece of... It's not feeling like a god amongst... A piece of shit. A piece of dog shit. And then all of a sudden, in another sudden moment, Michael saw into Dorian as Dorian saw into Michael back. Each man looking into the abyss of each own's being. And... I see you now, son. I see you. Just what I figured, responded the man Michael felt twins with. You see me what? Oh, fuck this. Fuck you, old man. Go fuck yourself. Lashed out Michael as he felt his mitts speaking in demonic tongues again, and this time for the blood of another. All it would take is just one pull of this trigger. Just one. One simple one. Such a simple gesture to send this devil to hell for which he came, thought Michael as he felt it. Felt the thrill of that kill, then felt the shock, something overbearing, scarring him back. Now imagine it, son, imagine if all these whimpering, moaning, pitiful cowards out there, if they were to also experience what we have experienced. What have I said I've experienced it? When? Ah, shit, I'm talking out loud. People of this city already want it. They already crave it and desire it, and they definitely do need it. The only problem has been up until now, they just haven't known where to begin. So you want to turn everyone into monsters like you? Is that it? Gasped Michael. All I needed to do was light a match and look at the city now. The old Norse devil with his old Norse ways then grinned at Michael and said nothing else. You're trying to... <laughs> You trying to drive the city into complete madness so everyone can rip each other apart and... Michael was trembling now. Not just from fear, but also subversively from excitement. He felt exactly as he did that instant. That moment back in his crummy apartment that had awoken him. He remembered the feeling of pain when he cut himself, smashing in his bathroom mirror. It was the pain that excited him, uplifted him, and gave him the drive and direction to go on and come all this way. Am I sick? Am I a sick fuck like him? Up until this point, Michael really hadn't contemplated over the events of this night in this light, even though he figured himself to be a seriously crazy individual for having come all this way, when he could have just stayed behind in his apartment and decided to move on with his life. Even though he figured himself to be a crazy to come all this way, he hadn't felt completely disgusted by what he had done, either, at least. The way I see it, based on my own definition... I see there's to be a difference between a crazy man and a sick man. A crazy man will try to do the impossible for all the right reasons. A sick man will try to do the impossible for all the wrong ones. That there I see at least to be, at least to me is the difference. The question now was, was Michael or Mad Boy at the right or wrong? You know... Maybe I should just shoot you in the fucking head and end this, said Michael, bluffingly, afraid to continue contemplating over that matter, considering he was only a trigger away from possibly answering that question. Well, fuck that, this kill would be in the right. 
No f- doubt about it, right? Right? You do that and I and my friend here will blow you two away. How does that sound, Karachimba? Responded the other scary fucker Michael had almost totally forgotten about. Michael! Then pleaded Nikki alarmingly. <laughs>